नमस्ते दिस इज सैम बुटानी एंड यूर लिसनिंग टू चाई टाइम डेटा साइंस अ पॉडकास्ट फॉर डेटा साइंस एंड तूजियास वेर आई इंटरव्यू प्रैक्टिशनर्स रिसर्चर्स एंड कैकलर्स अबाउट देयर जर्नी एक्सपीरियंस एंड टॉक ऑल थिंग्स अबाउट डेटा साइंस Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I interview the CTO of H two O dot AI, Arno Kandel. I feel this is a very unique interview on the series, even though where we talk all about Arno's journey into the field, the comments and the insights by Arno are really broadly applicable to the field and not just limited to his journey. So I'm really excited to be releasing this interview. We talk all about Arno's journey, of course. and machine learning automated machine learning broadly speaking we discuss his journey from being a physicist to eventually changing his role into software engineering followed by machine learning and his journey at h2o we also discuss all about h2o's vision products and the maker culture as we call it note this is a special interview that's being released on h2o.ai's youtube channel so thanks to h2o for letting me do that if you're curious to check out all of the other interviews that are going on you can find the link to the playlist in the description of this episode for now here's my interview with dr arno kandel please enjoy the show Hi everyone it's a great moment in time where i get to interview if you may quote and quote my boss the cto of h2o.ai hello dr arno kandel thank you so much for joining me on the chai time data science podcast it's my pleasure um so you hold a phd in a uh, phd in physics from eth and you worked across multiple roles including staff research scientist senior member of technical staff and now is the cto in a machine learning domain and you've also ac- worked across different domains could you tell us how did you get started with data science when did you find your passion for the field yes absolutely so as a child i always enjoyed programming as soon as i had access to a computer i wanted to program especially asteroids flying around you know simulating nature and i i developed this joy of physics and science and general i wanted to be good at school no matter what it was so i was good okay. in history and you know in soccer whatever you may with art and i i just kind of wanted to solve all the puzzles that the school was throwing at me and and one of the problems later became well, what do you want to do after high school right because i grew yeah. up in switzerland and in switzerland pretty much everybody can go to universities because they're free you know you just go to the closest university and you get a phd basically if you okay. don't take if you only say yes you're good right so i kept saying yes 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 i just want to continue and i became a phd in physics and uh, the, the the thesis of my phd thesis um you had to pick something right so i asked uh, one of the professors well, what do you recommend is there anything you can uh, tell me what i should do because i love uh, simulations i love you know i love physics nature and all that and he said he was the director by the way of a particle physics laboratory with like okay employees and he said why don't you simulate our proton accelerator mm-hmm. with uh, supercomputing and c++ you know and distributed clustered computing and all that so i said okay that sounds great let me do that and that turned basically from a master's thesis into a phd thesis okay. and connected me with all these accelerator scientists and also with a professor that was teaching uh, um computational physics and he's now doing quantum computing at microsoft he's also okay. one of the world's leader in that field so very very good people i had access to as a student right it was a privilege and basically i got paid to do a phd in in supercomputing <laughs> physics um linux you know beowulf clusters we had access to hundreds of servers back in 2000 and well okay programming on a little laptop but we had c++ compilers templates all the smart stuff of of programming and it was basically a hobby that turned into reality and after 3 years i got my phd 
in the same room as uh, Pauli, one of the physics gods, basically. Uh, okay. You know, this Pauli room that he was teaching and all that. So it was pretty prestigious. And that all was half an hour from where I grew up. So I would say very fortunate to have grown up in Switzerland. Of course, my parents were always very encouraging to do whatever I wanted. And they gave me a great uh, home and a great culture and upbringing and all that. And finally, I got basically to have this PhD in hand. And because I was working on this uh, physics problem, um, mm -hmm. other people in the world took notice, especially once I was in Russia, I presented my work and someone from Stanford saw that I was doing something that they are interested in, namely the simulation of electrons in an accelerator cavity. Mm -hmm. When you have 50 megawatts of power jolting these electrons around, that uh, simulation uh, to do that on a supercomputer was something that hadn't existed before. And to do that well uh, was exactly my thesis. So they said, why don't you come work for us? Come to Stanford. And I was like, okay. what's Stanford, right? I, I didn't know on the map <laughs> literally where Stanford was. They said, well, San Francisco. I, oh, okay, okay, I got it. <laughs> so I, I basically flew for one month to Stanford to see the area and all that. And after a while, I said, of course, I'll do that. They offered me a job at Stanford's uh, Linear Accelerator Physics Laboratory. And that was my first six years, basically, in the U.S. So I happened to be implanted into the Silicon Valley, but I was on the other side of Sand Hill Road. For those okay. that know Sand Hill Road, one side is the venture capitalist, the other side is this particle physics laboratory. <laughs> okay. Every day I drove by and saw all these uh, expensive cars turn right. And <laughs> but there was some, I believe, influence bleeding in from the other edge as well? Um, we didn't have any connection to the VC world, to be honest. It was purely research and science. So we were talking to the people in Geneva, the particle accelerator uh, called CERN. So they had these massive, mild-sized uh, hadron colliders and all that. We were working with those people, right? So they were our customers, if you want. We were making simulations at this uh, particle accelerator lab called Slack. And Indeed just like the chat system without the K at the end. So it's Slack, S-L-A-C. Okay. And that was the, they won two Nobel Prizes for, uh, you know, the discoveries in particle physics. And um, all, they was do, all they were doing was research in, in elementary particle physics using those massive machines, like thousand microwaves on top of each other, all in the size mm -hmm. of one, right? So highly energetic, um, electric systems that were pushing these particles around in vacuum basically in some copper pipes and Got these it. copper pipes would almost melt and you would have to time everything just right to accelerate the particles to the speed of light after a few inches right but they would go on for a mile and get faster and faster okay so to the speed of light and at the end you would smash them into something and or, or wiggle them to create light coming out and so on. So there were lots of use cases of these physics experiments, but I would say what I was working on was always on the future. So we were trying to predict the behavior of these particles in a new regime where they were jolted around even more than before. And the question was, can you build a machine that costs hundreds of millions or up to $10 billion and oh. then behave in a certain way, right? And this machine hasn't even been built yet to some extent. Some of them haven't been built in even 10, 15 years after that. But okay. some of them have been built. So some of them are actually in production right now, running and doing uh, good stuff for research in biology, cancer research, and so on, Alzheimer's. So there's lots of interesting stuff coming out of this physics research that we helped to work on. But then after a while, um, I got my green card and I saw all my friends doing uh, the startup stuff and, and, <laughs> you know, and the, the influence market. of Silicon Valley. And I basically, um, I got pulled into the machine learning field back then when it was not yet called data science, right? There was the term, <laughs> science, but it was just barely coming out. Most people would call it big data analytics or, you know, um, just big data in general. And all they were doing were uh, we were writing algorithms also just like in, in, in nature and in science when you model some physics laws, they would model some, some equations that some mathematicians came up with and said, build a decision tree or, you know, build some, some uh, K nearest neighbors. And those equations are simple, but the hard stuff was to make it fast, you know, to make it run <laughs> gigabytes or terabytes, make it run on parallel systems. Make it it still is a, a challenge of sorts. 
Yes, yes. Just doing something simple really well that it works for everybody is hard, right? And, yep. and that's kind of the joy I got is to try to make random forest really fast or gradient boosting really fast or collaborative filtering really fast. So the, there was the first startup I joined as one of the first engineers, uh, the first hire actually. And after two years, I joined H2O where I've been now since uh, 2011, late 2000, no, actually 2013, sorry, 2013. Okay. 11 was when I started with machine learning. Okay. So I've been in the field for about eight years now. And I think that's why you're a fortune uh, recognized big data star and not a machine learning star because it wasn't called machine learning back in the day. Back then it was all just like, do you have data? Yes. Okay. Do something. <laughs> and even today I'm really scared sometimes when people have their data and they do something with it. They might not really know what they're doing, right? There's a lot of mistakes that you can make with uh, cross validation or validation or the wrong, you know, you have the wrong feature somewhere that gives away the future and then you're training on it and so on. We can talk about <laughs> that for endless uh, hours, yeah. but there is lots of things that you can do that's wrong. And uh, we're still in an early space, right? The whole world needs a little bit more help, I would say. Uh, and, and machine learning is still a little bit difficult, I would say, but we're trying to make it easier for everybody. So that's what our mission is at H2O, obviously. And since you joined, and by the way, congrats to your uh, graduation. I heard the good Thanks news. Thanks so much. The honors and all that it's awesome so we have you on board and we are very uh, fortunate to have so much talent in the company and, and we have a great mission right it's really give this insight that st sits inside the data give that to the people that own the data right it's it's almost like an exploration into the already existing truth it's like when you carve a statue out of a stone the stone is there the statue is already there just not visible and yeah. The data is the same thing, right? There's a lot of insights and it's hard to see from which angle you have to look to actually see that information. And uh, if you look from the wrong side, you don't see anything. So kind of unearthing that knowledge is as our mission. That's a great and, analogy uh, also in terms of machine learning as an art, uh, so to speak. It is still almost alchemy, right? There's like you ask 12 different <laughs> people, they all will say, oh, do the reinforcement learning, do XG boost, you know, do logistic regression. <laughs> explain it or I don't explain it, you know, all these different opinions and, and, yeah. and there's not really one truth because even if you get the higher AUC, let's say, like a better model, what does it mean it's better? It's mm -hmm. only better on that one data set that you measured it on, right? How about tomorrow's data set? Yeah. Nobody's going to answer that. So it's, <laughs> it's not trivial, yeah, for sure. Uh, we'll talk more about H2O just in a bit, but uh, just trying to connect the dots here because I remember reading that since you were fascinated with asteroids, you did program uh, your first Hello World was uh, Asteroid Simulator in BASIC. So trying to connect the dots for you always a coder throughout this period as you were even working in research or did you shift from physics to a coding environment? I would say I was always a coder, yes. So my emphasis has always been on the, the programming part, even of science and, and physics and all that. So pretty much every day for the last 20 years, I've been programming something. So uh, that would be true, I can say for sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which also brings me to the fact that you previously you were called a physics and hacker at SO.ai. So broadly thinking, do you find any parallels in physics and uh, data science? Absolutely, yes. So physics basically teaches you one thing, if not many more things, but at least it teaches you one thing, which is to think uh, critically about what you're doing, right? Because if, if you're in physics, you have to like figure out why the hydrogen atom behaves the way it does. You have to do path integrals of quantum electrodynamics or quantum chromodynamics. All these theories are super complicated. It takes I invest stuff. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's so crazy that if you don't know what you're doing, you might as well give up because there's no point in going down that rabbit hole. You just yeah. guess. Right? So you basically learn to take every step carefully and make sure you have the basics right. And if you're in data science, you kind of don't need to do it sometimes. You can just say, yeah, let me just fit the random forest and see what they will be. You know? But if you want to do it right, you should say, well, what was the foundation that I have behind it? Was it actually doing the right sampling first or not? Or, you know, which columns does it pick? Which decisions does it make? How does it make decisions when it makes a split in a tree? What does it mean it made that split? Which hmm. row goes where? 
And what yeah. does it mean for the next tree you're building? Is it is it correlated with like in gradient boosting or is it independent? Like you ask all these questions and you actually implement it from scratch. Every single line of code has to be right, otherwise the whole thing is wrong, right? And right. you're basically asking yourself constantly, hmm, out of these 12 things I could be typing, which one should I type, right? In the end, the keyboard doesn't have path integrals or you know, anything complicated. The keyboard just has plus, minus, and you know, divided in times and all that. So you have to figure out how to write it in such a form that you can represent the, 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 this, this hard storytelling with those simple keyboard uh, keys. Yeah. And, and you have to say, okay, I'll let me do some kind of thinning or let me do some kind of you know, tree structure to represent the data. And then when I do sort on it, becomes this and this complexity. So you have to think about the cost of everything you're doing so that it becomes fast and, and accurate, right? And the physicist kind of has this, this big, big picture thinking where you think in the magnitude only. So is it like 10 or 100 or 1,000? Physicists always think in those kinds of terms. They don't care if it's 7 or 12, right? It's like, what order magnitude am I talking about? And, and in that picture of magnitude, you, you then worry about the next order thing. Once you are sure that you're in the right frame, then you say, well, what can I do next to improve? Yeah. So that, I would say that's the, the, the secret of a physicist working in any field really is the ability it's, to keep the big picture and the small picture at the same time. I think it's again, like you said, uh, thinking of the sculpture while looking at the stone uh, mm-hmm. analogy. Yes, yes. And obviously there's other people that can do it. It's not just physicists, right? I'm a little biased here, but anybody <laughs> with a scientific background who spent years thinking about simple stuff like, you know, derivations of some mathematical terms or whatever, it helps a lot, right? The analytical yeah. thinking skills get, get further. And the more you are uh, distant from that, the more you're likely to say, ah, I don't really need to know that. Let me just play around and become the alchemist, let's say. But, yeah. Uh, if you really want to understand it, it, it's definitely helpful to have gone through this exercise once at least. I think it right? <laughs> <laughs> forces you to actually go deeper than just alchemy. Yeah. Also thinking of it uh, right now that the science and data science really comes from that fact that it's an experiment first versus theory first uh, subject, if I may. Yes, yes, definitely. And it's we're lowering the bars with all these platforms that are out there, you know, from TensorFlow to PyTorch, sklearn, and even our products, they make it so easy. Click one button, you just immediately, you get a solution, right? And you get a number and that number is pretty good. So you might yeah. be tempted to say, oh, well, let me just put that in production without thinking about what it actually means. And I think if anything, you should think first, do a couple of experiments and then see if your hypothesis holds, right? And if, if that's the case, then you can be more confident. But you should not just yeah. run one experiment and trust it blindly, unless you're okay. sure that you're in that framework where you've done it before and this data is the same, everything is the same, then you can just do one more like it. But Please. if you're starting fresh, you should spend a few weeks always on a data set. Got it. So coming to your current day job uh, can you tell us what does a day in your life look like do you spend time on kaggle all of the day or do you have chai with grandmasters at the h2 hq well a little bit of all actually so i, I did spend <laughs> time on kaggle the last few weeks uh, maybe just a few percent of my day right and only okay. for a or so of the whole year so it's very little unfortunately i like kaggle a lot i would have preferred if i could like just spend weeks on it and just delve on one problem but i would be a very good debugging tool if, if your uh, software doesn't run on a Kaggle problem, there's probably a reason why it doesn't. And um, often it's because you didn't exploit the leak or you didn't have the test set abused as you're training or something that you can like learn everything about the future, even though you're not supposed to actually know that, right? So yeah. there's, there's a couple of things you're maybe stretching the, the truth a little bit or stretching mm-hmm. the, the, the arms of what's possible for an enterprise. Sometimes they don't have future transactions, right? And you, in a Kaggle, you do get them. So let's assume you don't have any future information. It's all fair. Still, Kaggle helps you, right? Because the very first time you press fit and you see what happens, <laughs> more likely you say, oh, wow, I'm so much worse than the leaders on that leaderboard. <laughs> yeah. So it, it does give you some kind of feedback. And 
and we did do that a couple of times successfully, right? Like for example, there was this Kaggle days um, earlier this year, I think when Google's AutoML came out for the first mm -hmm. time and we did place right next to it in, in that leaderboard. I'm, I'm on it there. And our I believe you fourth on the leaderboard. I was using driverless AI, right? <laughs> and I think um, there were other people that we know from the community, they were like third or something. So there were only, there was very little gap in between us and Google. And mm -hmm. I think that data set was mostly noise anyway. So it's kind of hard to, the error bars must have been way bigger than the actual differences at the mm -hmm. top. So I feel pretty good. That one was one that we did well at. And there are some others that we're doing well at, but often it's about the framing of the problem, right? And just thinking about um, what is it that made my solution not work right out of the box? Right. It helps you to make it better and generalize more because it doesn't have to just work for that Kaggle problem. It has to work for everybody's Kaggle problem in the whole world, for every yeah. customer, every industry, right? We have a very broad um, target here. We want to be a general purpose machine learning platform. And that's a good, it's a good stomping grounds for sure. Mm -hmm. But my typical day, I would say, is mostly uh, talking to people and then programming, right? And figuring out what's customer feedback. So I'm involved in customer discussions and in internal discussions. And once we know what's going on, uh, program basically, fix the issues or talk to other people and then fix the issues. I, I, I really love to be doing one-on-ones with various people. So I talk to grandmasters a lot, that's for sure. Now that we have 13 <laughs> at the H2O, right? H2O to the I, 13 grandmasters is a lot to digest. You can talk to them all day long and you'll always learn something new. So. Uh, the, the ability to quickly get feedback about any topic, and that's always expert feedback. That's yeah. so much input into somebody who needs to program. So us as programmers, our engineering team has so much to do, and they're all amazing, right? Not just the grandmasters, also yeah. the engineers. This team is so great that they just listen to what the grandmasters say, and then it becomes a, a, a solution inside the product. And often the grandmasters are programming themselves, right? Which is even better because... They've done it for all these Kaggle problems in Python. Why not do it for driverless AI, for example, which is also yeah. in Python. So our recipe architecture makes that kind of easy. They can, they can prototype their own ideas in, in minutes. And then when it works, we can just ship it to the customer basically after minimal modifications and making sure that it's actually robust and all that. That's one of the highlights of my day, just mentioning it for the audience, just bragging, if I may, that I get to sit right next to SRK Sudley Rajkumar. I still pinch myself every day, but <laughs> that's really a highlight of my every day. Absolutely, yes. The talent pool is just amazing. And the ability for us to tap right into those grandmasters because they all talk to each other and say, go to h to all right? <laughs> so it's, it's actually, <laughs> we, should, we should say the same thing. If you are really good at data science, you'll offer to do it. That's really all we uh, want, right? We are, we are into this not for anything but enjoyment. We all love it so much that that's all we do, right? Every day we're in the flow where ability meets the demand on you. So you're always able to deliver what needs to be delivered. Yeah. You're never stressed that you're like too weak or so because we're not asking you to, to <clears throat> re-implement TensorFlow on a laptop or something. <laughs> you know, it, it has to be... It has to be something realistic, but if you're a grandmaster already, then kind of nothing is too hard for you. Right? You're, yeah. you're to, to, to going through this pain until you make it on the other side. And I think the same is true for the engineering in our department. Um, we have a lot of really well, um, you know, proven engineers that have shipped all these solutions on like power PCs in Docker, you know, Kubernetes, this and that, on Spark or not, all these solutions with and with security, database connectors, all these complexities of the real world, it's far more than just machine learning, right? It's, yeah. it's shipping this uh, key, um, what is it called, when you can turn the turn key ready or something, just into the hands of the data hmm. scientists. And they don't even need to worry that this whole thing is, is virtualized or whatever, it just kind of works. And that's really the strength of this team is the, the middleware for AI, right? Yeah. And, and obviously the grandmasters have added some of the smarts inside, but there's a lot of building like onion layers, if you want, that make this, this whole uh, software product consumable. And there's a lot more than just data science. I would say at least two or three X in overall terms more than mm -hmm. just data science. But of course the data science core 
the, this, the smart sampling, the smart model selection, tuning, feature selection, you know, yeah. and then also being able to deploy the final model after you made an ensemble with feature engineering and all that super complicated Kaggle style pipeline, you push a button and you get a Java pipeline out, purely <laughs> standalone in Java, absolutely no Python, and you get the whole thing as a jar that you can deploy, right? That's almost a miracle. And, and we were able to pull that off because somebody painstakingly uh, re-implemented every single transformer and model in Java to yeah. be able to store, right? And <laughs> just to test this is also non-trivial, right? So I think we're very proud of the team, and it, it's fun to work with all these different aspects. It's it's really it's really fun, and every time there's some accuracy issue where we say it's not quite smart enough, the grand masters obviously have plenty of ideas. Also, yeah. how to do with PyTorch, TensorFlow, all these new technologies that obviously we've been doing deep learning for years, but not to the extent that you would need to do for like NLP or mm -hmm. images. Now we have image grandmasters, NLP grandmasters, just like SRK and others, but they, they're like Sudoku champions of the world, basically, <laughs> at the same time, right? And these, these are so amazing talents that basically just building an NLP model is almost too easy. Right? You have to always keep asking them for a little bit more and keep them stimulated and keep them involved. But I think we're able to do that. That's why h is such a great place. I think it's really a privilege for me, at least, to be on such a awesome team can you confirm or deny the fact that you ever sleep because i've seen you active on slack throughout all times of the day <laughs> i do sleep yes I do, I do have two little boys that jump on me at night so I, <laughs> sometimes i don't sleep because of that but i do get some sleep but as you can see um, i have a computer mouse right here right this is always <laughs> like no matter where i am i always have a computer with me and i would say i'm pretty much thinking about uh, something that's running in the background all the time. So I have like two or three computers, two, uh, two at home and one in the office that are constantly running some tests or yeah. you know, some, something. And I, I, every time I have an opportunity to check, I make a decision based on facts, basically. And I'm trying to, to um, optimize my time, right? And every day, time is like never enough. Sometimes you sit, sit here at five in the morning and the sun comes up and you're like, oh shoot, I'm going to sleep. I, I, I need to go to bed. Right? <laughs> so that's true. It sometimes gets into the thick of things. But I would say overall, it's a pretty healthy life, especially because I'm happy, right? It's important to be happy. If, if this was like forced upon me, I would say, oh my God, that's terrible. <laughs> it's, not. it's actually what I want to do. So that's my choice. I, I think the that. passion, so giving some insider info, If just scrolling through the Slack, the passion is shared throughout the team. I think it's, as we call the maker culture, it's present across everyone on, on board. Exactly. And I think it's important to state that again, right? If you're not that kind of person that wants to just do what they want to do on their own, like be creative and be like, you know, trying out until it works and then saying, here, I, I did this, try it. If you're not that person, if you're more like into, um, I want to be told what I should be doing and I want this role and I want to fit into this gear <laughs> of the overall system and this is my position, then H2O might not be the best place, right? Because we don't have as much bandwidth to constantly tell you what to do or what not to do and to check you. So that's why we're kind of the, the maker's place where each maker is the wheel, but it's organically forming, right? It's like when you push an avalanche forward, it's not gonna, each, each snowflake isn't gonna ask the others, where should I go, right? <laughs> just go, go. And they all roll and they all move. And, and I think that's the key. So you, even if the story changes, let's say there, there's a, a new product we ship or we have a new idea or somebody came up with a great new prototype, suddenly we say, let's, let's put more horses behind it. Mm -hmm. Then it might happen overnight, right? Tomorrow we might say, let's do something new. And, and that's the, the joy, right? You get the good people and then you figure out what to do later. And you just, you just do what you feel like is right. And obviously it's not single persons. It's always a team. It's always as a whole, we kind of figured out what to do. There's a lot of discussions going on, even though not everybody is always involved. But yeah. I would say I am not fully involved in most of these. I just hear okay. from the peripherals, but I hear enough. And then when it gets important, always somebody asks me, what do you think? And they ask the grandmaster, what do you think? And then they ask somebody, what do you think? It's a very liberal system, right? In the end, yeah. whoever trusts someone else asks them, what do you think? And 
if the overall sentiment is, nah, it's not a good idea, it will come up. And mm -hmm. if the overall sentiment is, yeah, sounds good, but I don't have time right now, then you still will do the old stuff. Mm -hmm. But once you have time, or you feel like, yeah, actually the momentum is shifting, let me do a little bit more of the new stuff, suddenly you're on the new stuff. And that's because yeah. you feel it's a good thing, right? It's not because someone told you to do it, it's because you know, I think it's the right thing. And this is the culture that Sri, our CEO, has uh, put out to us, right? He's, he's always said, do what's right, basically. Do, you know, you decide, uh, I'll just give you ideas, basically. Yeah. And he, this is the power, right, of the maker culture. It's, it's very visionary to, to let everybody be a maker and not just be told what to do, right? You're not making it for him. You're making it for yourself. This is our yeah. careers. It's our company. And we all together are building something that, if you want to ship iTorch's NLP models, you're welcome to hack it in and in a few weeks it's shipped, right? And, and that's exactly how it works. So mm -hmm. I think it's very liberating to be able to deliver at any level. And this, this meritocracy definitely works for us. It also speaks about the cutting edge of machine learning really lies at the engineering level if you're uh, facing people. For example, you were already talking about these onion layers of engineering that go into place. So it's also about building products and shipping them really fast as engineers are supposed to do, but in this domain. Yes, definitely. It's, it's the, the, the speed is something we, we are very, very uh, known of, right? Basically, nobody <laughs> can innovate quicker, right? And our challenging quotes is to make sure it's still robust and stable. So sometimes we shipped it so fast that there were some obvious bugs left, right? It's almost like saying, the, the early Tesla had some battery issues or something, and then we have to fix it, and after a while it gets better. And luckily, because it's software, you can fix it, and our customers are usually flexible enough to just upgrade when we have a new version. And I think mm -hmm. over the two years it has matured a lot, and now I would say it's, it's very good. We do random attacks all day and night to make sure that no bug escapes, right? And yeah. it's still not easy because it's such a complicated beast, but I would say... Um, Definitely, uh, the products both have gotten a lot more stable in the last few years, and that's been the reason why our products are so widely adopted. So the open source H203, by the way, which, which is really widely used, hundreds of thousands of people are using it, right? That's, that's a great workhorse, and it's, a, it's an amazing product. It can scale to like thousands of nodes and mm -hmm. terabytes of data and just runs a great boosting machine, right? And, and driverless AI, for those who don't know, is basically the single node solution at the moment, but it's a, a super smart calculator in the box, basically. It does all kinds of feature engineering. So uh, one thing is the feature engineering mm -hmm. brain that tries different experiments and gives you the single best model on your data. And the yeah. other thing the, is the workhorse that just chews through data like nothing in a distributed system. So if you have really big data, you want to use h 2 and that also exists on Sparks. It's called sparkling water. And if you have up to, say, 100 gigabytes or so smaller data, not terabytes, then you can use driverless AI where you will get most likely a slightly better model, if not a much better model, depending on the problem case. It also mm -hmm. can handle time series, TensorFlow, and all that stuff. So because it's based on Python, right, you can do anything. So I think the, the beauty of Python really is that every data scientist now that's in Kaggle doing well, right, says, oh, yeah, I wrote all this Python. <laughs> and we can just take it as a recipe and plug it in while it's running, right? And that's yeah. kind of cool. So this, this recipe architecture really made our life a lot easier because now everybody can be contributing code and not just a few programmers, let's say, that know how to write these algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, you already mentioned a bunch of products uh, that h 2 a is shipping, both open source and commercial. Could you help us uh, distinguish between these and understand because all of these are currently in active development? Yes, yes. So the open source distributed uh, worker machine that's amazingly scalable and, and, and performant, that's called H double three, right? And that's open source, 100% open source, but customers still are buying the, the license for it to get support and so on, because we're helping them to make the most of it and we help them to deploy it. And there is different products around it, like Sparkling Water and Steam, that help you run this in a multi-tenant setup on Spark and Kubernetes and so on. And then driverless AI is the, the Kaggler in a box, if you want, that I mentioned, that, is, <laughs> that does a lot more feature engineering than anything in the planet, basically. Super Kaggler in a box. Yeah, exactly. Nice, all the, the, you know, all these stratified splits and all kinds of 
you know, smart ways of phrasing the, the data into new data where we can extract information from other roles across, uh, you know, cohorts across, you know, time, all that with, with time series of air modeling and so on. And it, it really is, is also taking advantage of multiple GPUs on the box. It's designed to be highly parallel and fast. So it, it builds hundreds of models, thousands of features, all while you are just you know, going for lunch or something. And when you come back, you get this Java artifact back that is the standalone scoring pipeline. And now we have also a C++ artifact mm -hmm. that's also standalone, which means you can call it from R and Python without having wheels and all that stuff from Python. So you can have the super lightweight, low latency, Python and R and C++ and Java scoring. And for those who have custom recipes, you can always get the Python version as well, the, the pickled version, basically, the, the normal version that you would call it, but it includes all the feature engineering of a grandmaster and every single pipeline prediction step has all these steps in it. So it's, it's pretty well, um, you know, geared towards production deployment. You just take it and put it in production and it, it will make the right predictions. And it also has interpretability and visualization components to make sure that the models are not, as in Apple's and Goldman's case right now, uh, slightly critical, right, in terms of who they allow to be favored by the model. So you can yeah. at least track those models, figure out those who's being um, given credit or not and, and why that is. and for which segment of the population the models behave differently and so on. So all this model debugging is, is part of a driverless AI as well. I'd like to mention to the audience because I know a lot of them are students. If you're a student, you can go and check out driverless AI. Uh, for academics, it's free of cost licensed. So just go to the website linked in the description of the podcast. And all of these techniques that Arno has mentioned are already there. It's not an upcoming feature that he's mentioned. Yes, absolutely. Our academic uh, program is, is open to any academics, so you get that for free and you get the full feature product. So there's, there's absolutely no uh, limitations and it really does work well for Kaggle. <laughs> <laughs> it, it gives you the feedback that you need, right? which features are important and which interactions matter. It will uh, help you quickly go through your features and tell you whether they are useful or not and so on, and your ideas. So you can throw in a bunch of ideas in terms of recipes, transformers or models, and you can figure out much more about that on our website, h 2 And I mean, there is so much in there, you could probably study it for weeks and still not know <laughs> half of what's actually in there. And that's one of our challenges, right? It's it's. It's hard enough for us to know what we're shipping, much less that the customers will know what's actually in there. So our challenge now is to put another layer on it to make it easier to consume and say it just works for you. But that obviously then has to be a specific vertical. It's, it's not easy to say, here's a general purpose machine learning platform and you have no control. Yeah. People don't want that either. People want to have control. But once that is a vertical, like, let's say it's specific to solving one issue for one factory, somewhere then you can frame it as just push the button basically right give me data and i'll tell you the future or something and that's something that we are now working on with uh, the next generation called q where you can make smart applications that are ai enabled applications where where all in python you can author a full gui experience around the actual driverless back uh, engine right mm -hmm. so uh, it's a it's an application builder kit, if you want, that is yeah. coming up in coming months. And that will be super exciting for the world. I'm pretty sure that that will find a lot of good use cases. Subscribe to Chai Time Data Science for a <laughs> discussion on that whenever that will come out. Yes, definitely. Yes. And we have some amazing people on that team that are like, you know, bursting with ideas and, and prototypes and so on. So it will be fun to announce that in more detail. Uh, coming to another aspect of uh, auto ML, automated machine learning, uh, can you speak to, do you think it should be a one click, everything solved uh, situation or like we were talking with Q, a human in the loop or a data scientist in the loop for solving a data science product with auto ML situation? 
Yes, I would definitely say human-machine interaction will be the strongest asset of, of humans, right? Like you don't want to be alone um, with a robot taking control unless that robot really is good, right? And, yep. and in your case, let's say if you're, a, if you're in a car and the car is driving itself, I would say it's okay. At some point, it will be fine. At some point, you have enough radars and lidars and all these optics and you know, systems that can detect distances and so on from other objects probably will be safer to let them drive than you falling asleep or something or somebody texting you. <laughs> so I would say self-driving cars I can live with, self-driving data science decisions for very, very important business problems, I would say is not the best idea, right? Yep. And as we just saw, um, big companies can get into trouble um, and they make wrong predictions or give credit to the wrong people or the right people in the wrong amounts and so on. And you have to debug this stuff and you have to think about what it means. You have to debug. Um, because humans are at the end of, uh, humans do receive the consequences of such situations. And even in the driving, self-driving cars, you can say it should always be a human involved. Yes, in the training of these models at least, right? So we're not talking about the scoring of the model should be done by a human. We're saying the training of the model. So once the training of the model is done, I'm fine running the predictions through the algorithm, right? And that's basically what a self-driving car is doing. It's saying, given this situation, what should I do? And if that model was trained properly, then it's all fine. Now the question is, what is good enough, right? Do you want to yeah. have, you know... You want to have a hundred different models all doing some voting, and then you know when they all say turn left, then you turn left, and otherwise you say beep beep beep. I'm not sure what to do. Or do you want to like you know say ah it's good enough if 80% say turn left, you know? So at what point is good enough good enough? And that's again data science, right? Like how do you know is an algorithm good or bad? Mm -hmm. Obviously you can measure it in one holdout, but is that enough? You need a hundred holdouts. What do you do with your time series? You don't have a hundred holdouts. How do you do it, you know, when things are shifting and drifting and so on? So at some point, there is no answer. You do not know what your, what your best model is, right? That is one What happens when you become the state of the art? Where do you go from there? What if it snows and it's windy and the pole is falling over <laughs> and you have to, like, extrapolate where it's going to fall, right? Should you step on the brakes or should you push the gas pedal? So it's not easy to say what's right and what's wrong. And in data science for business, it's the same, right? Yep. It's, it's always a question of what's the best price performance payoff. And I would say humans are smart enough to make these kinds of decisions, what is valuable to them. Mm -hmm. And so as long as money is involved, some human should think about it, right? And then yep. the algorithm yep. will take care of the statistics, basically. But yep. of course, there's bias in the statistics. So if you, have, if you don't like the facts as they are, and you want the model to not behave like the data says you should behave, then mm -hmm. you need to fix it, right? And you need to change the data or change the model to behave in a certain way that you like again. And that's the art of a data scientist is to, is basically take the horse and control it with the directional input, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't want to just say, go wild and just slap the horse on the back and, and wait to <laughs> see how it's going. You yeah. want to basically control it, right? And and I would say that's the real art. And if you look at Kaggle, some of the grandmasters are doing like super deep ensembles and all that stuff. And others are just thinking about the data and nudging it slightly in the right direction. And suddenly it's the best single model, right? Yeah. And I would say people who can they make one good single model are um, almost more respectable, let's say, in terms of Kaggle achievements than those who can stack the most because... Yeah. Stacking the most by itself doesn't mean it's, it's, the, uh, it's, it's that hard to do, just work. However, if you can program this stacker, that's also great, right? And you have Kasova, for example, who wrote StackNet, and he was years ahead of everybody yep. writing a whole framework for stackings that he won all the competitions just because <laughs> of that tool, right? So yeah. there is an art everywhere. But if I had to trust somebody for my business decision, I would say, it should be somebody who understands the data, right? And I think mm. that will be the hardest part for our future because the data grows so fast. Humans' brains don't grow that fast, right? They are actually the same as they were thousands of years ago. So yep. how do we deal with this growth and complexity? We have to find some kind of layer of abstraction in which we can talk to that system. And yep. the machine will get smarter and smarter at fitting 
but not necessarily at knowing what to fit, right? Mm -hmm. And we still need to tell it what to fit. So at some point, the whole thing will stagnate and we'll just be where we are. And our ability to know what to do will be the limiting bottleneck, right? Yeah. Like what to throw into the system, basically. And then <laughs> creativity comes in where people can maybe figure out new ways of mixing data. Mm. And Sri always makes these examples of, you know, one company has data exhaust and the other company could use that, right? For example, a company that, uh, that fills in your, your salaries doesn't know that they're, they could be selling that information to a bank, right? Mm -hmm. And then the bank knows like who's going to buy the house or something and needs a mortgage and so on. So these kinds of interactions of data either lead to single companies becoming monopolies. So like yep. Apple and Amazon will be the bank of the future. And then they know everything about you. That is one option. The other option is that there will be a marketplace for data somehow where these companies uh, jointly figure out what's best for everybody, right? But there yeah. is a danger that companies will act only in their interest and not in the human's interest. So we need to figure out what's the right political thing for everybody so that the outcome is optimal, not just for the capitalists in us, but also the, the people in us, right? And that's, that's probably the bigger challenge. I think that's where a transparent and effective tool would come into play with a human in the loop who's also there to double check on it. Yes, yes. And then there should be some kind of a fairness kaggle, right? Not just the accuracy kaggle where <laughs> the, the overall system is measured by its goodness and not yep. just by score and statistical level. So there's a lot more to be rounded off in, in the overall world view, right? <laughs> and one number is definitely not enough. Like I always make that joke and I say, in the, in the beginning you had a terabyte and then out comes one AOC, right? And now you're saying, yeah. I won or something. Like how, <laughs> how do you know that that's actually the best model, right? So it, it's, it's, it's still interesting how you can actually know a little bit more about the steps in between. Yeah. That's missing, I would say, in the, in the field as a whole. Quick plug, uh, we just talked about Dan Master Casanova. I've already interviewed him on the series. So check out the link in the description if you'd like to read that interview. But um, coming to your journey at H2O.ai, we're already talking about future facing ideas. You worked as a physics physicist and hacker, then mm -hmm. as a chief architect and now as a as the CTO. Is the product still not up to your vision did you already envision such things when you got started if you could talk about the journey the products that you worked and how like yeah. it changed over the years it's actually i never thought we could get driverless ai going to this extent right when we started even the grandmasters they had no idea basically that this was possible so i think we overachieved in a way of technical abilities but maybe our 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 brains were not able to extrapolate to that extent maybe six years ago right when we started so at, at the beginning it was all about h 3 just writing algorithms from scratch making them faster making them even run debugging what is cross-validation you know how to do that right how what is this and that what is early stopping what is all the different parameters the depth the leaf the column sampling rate the row sampling rate you know the the number of rows in a leaf for each split, all these parameters, we had to implement them, right? And I remember I was reading your five-year-old discussions on Kaggle, mm -hmm. and even then, that day, uh, H2O3, uh, it, it's H2O3 now, but H2O was the fastest uh, library back in the day. Yes, yes. I mean, it still is super fast if you have big data, right? If you're running on hundreds of gigabytes, there's nothing that can beat it, I would say. It's, it's hard. Like maybe light GBM, maybe XGBoost in certain conditions. But overall, if you want a Java pipeline coming out, this is the best system. Uh, unless you want to do deep learning, right? Then you need TensorFlow or PyTorch. So I would say, and if you don't really care, you can do anything else, right? You can run SKLearn, you can run MLlib, you can... Any algorithm is fine if you just want to fit something rough, but if you want the highest accuracy and super fast, I would say H203 has, has, has some nice corners. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what's really special is that when, when we started the Kaggle years ago, obviously we were like thinking about, um, you know, how can I use H2O to solve Kaggle? And we were not able to get there, right? And we were trying okay, one more parameter, one more thing, but without stacking, it wasn't possible. So then we yeah. had AutoML in, in H203, which meant it's stacking, right? So suddenly you had stacking and then suddenly become 
it became a lot more accurate. But then it still wasn't enough to win Kaggle, so we had to <laughs> rival SCI to, to basically add feature engineering, right? And there are some competitions in Kaggle that we can place 10th place out of the box, out of 3,000 teams, right? And mm -hmm. that's without pushing any other button but go, right? It's really crazy. So these teams spent two months on it uh, three years ago, and now we just basically are the same as the, the winners. And, and that's pretty remarkable. And it's, it's something that uh, if you ask the grandmasters, they would have said, no, no, I'm smarter than the system. You know, like <laughs> chess players, just like all these video game players that now are being beaten by the systems. And if you just parameterize every choice and, and make it a algorithmic decision and that algorithm gets smarter over time, then it will at some point learn to do Kaggle, right? And that's almost basically where we are today except that it doesn't do all the systems and all the possible things right out of the box. Sometimes you need yep. to join data sets first or you need to do like an image problem. And we are adding image, by the way, as a, as a, as a category in addition to NLP. And so we have some tremendous uh, image progress as well where we can almost win image problems out of the box thanks to all these smart you know, neural architecture searches and single work cycle and you're talking to jeremy howard soon i, I heard so that's he's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna be happy to be using his insights from fast ai but yeah basically there's a lot of great stuff going on in, in in the field and with these insights you can now automate those things right you don't have to re-implement them every time for every single Kaggle problem you just put them once into the stable code base so in effect what we did is we took what the best calculus do put that into a software and keep reusing it, right? And it could have been one calculator that did it for himself or herself, but it's just, this is 20,000 commits, right? It's, it's a lot yeah. more work to like reiterate and test it and test it and test it. So it's, it's hard to do it alone, but as a system, as a company that does nothing else with dozens of people every day um, and our brains on it 24 seven, it really helps to get to that point where we kind of automated Kaggle. And I think that's cool. And the next step will be to automate the creation of business insights, right? And that's cute. And I think every every step is another step, and, and yeah. they're all they're all natural. And for me, the last six years, nothing has really changed. Right? Every day, I'm still coding. I'm I'm still involved in in the important projects in the company, and I'm just I'm doing what I can every day to make it better. Hmm. And try to ask others, what would you do? What would you think? How can you help? Like, what do you think we should be doing? Is this something you expect or not? Yeah. Right? We're not delegating work. We're just asking for help, basically. And everybody is willing to offer their expertise because they are experts at what they're doing. And they want to own that piece because that's what they enjoy doing, right? Yeah. It's like telling a kid, I need to go slide down this hill of snow. I have a sled. You have a sled. <laughs> Do you want to go yourself or can I go for you? And they say, no, 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 I want to go, right? So obviously they will go down the hill. And the yeah. same thing is true for, for this, uh, this kind of collaborative work. So that's the secret, if you want, is to have people who enjoy their work be able to contribute in a meaningful way and then own that piece all the way to production, right? Everybody who makes a piece of code owns that QA part too. You have to test that code. You can't yeah. just say it's, it's like someone else's problem now. <laughs> you actually have to make sure it works. And also, uh, thinking of it in this terms that this essentially, even though we're automating all of this uh, casual stuff, for example, will eventually allow us to think of broader problems, bigger ideas, because that's what is our end goal with all of this automation or machine learning going around. Yes, yes. I think the, the, the Q uh, approach we're taking with the start with the data and then figure out insights about the data and then let the, the machine give you a bunch of ideas and then you can basically interact with it and say, well, what about this? What about that? And then you see different views of the data. And if you, that, if you combine that with driverless, for example, or other models, and then you can take the residuals of the model on a holdout prediction, right? Like you can see what was wrong on my model and then you can plot that as a function of the data. And you can say for people in this zip code with this many cars, what are the error distributions? And then suddenly you can see, oh wow, it's actually only this zip code that's wrong. And you yeah. can automatically show that to you, right? So this is basically the, 
the next level. It's not just to say, oh, I fitted this really well and here are the predictions, but I can see where my model is not good and I can tell you where it is and almost maybe why it is, right? Because mm -hmm. you can see that people with this many cars and this zip code are totally mispredicted. But yep. exactly why the model is wrong, that's not, it's not as easy, right? That, that needs a little bit more work. But I would say this will be our next uh, frontier is where we can give general purpose insights about any data set and then totally. create stories out of it and help people you know, understand their data and not just make good models. Yep. Yeah. Now, coming to Kaggle, you're a competitions master. Could you tell us what made you sign up for your first competition and how did you get started on Kaggle? Yeah, that was when I joined H2O actually, or H2O.ai okay. as the company is actually called. So when I joined, um, there were a few data scientists in the company, very early days, and, and Shri was telling me like, why don't you go on Kaggle and see if it works, right? And I was like, oh, what's Kaggle? And then he said, I'll have to try it out, this is some competition. And I, I basically started doing H2O models on Kaggle. And, and then that's how we met Mark Landry because he was not yet at H2O. He, he basically um, joined, uh, he saw that I was at H2O. I was writing uh, these algorithms that he liked to use, right? Because he, he was and is an R user and we started doing R algorithms in the, in the early days and not Python yet, but now we have both obviously. But yep. back then it was all R. And these R algorithms were so powerful that they would be much faster than the built-in GBMs, let's say, of R. This h 2 GBM was faster. So Mark Landry, he was a really good data scientist at a different company, and he, he used this h 2 GBM and said, oh, wow, look, this is cool. Hey, Arno, uh, since you made this, do you want to work with me together on a Kaggle problem? Let's yeah. team, right? And only a few weeks later, he was on our Kaggle Grandmaster panel in 2014. <laughs> Uh, H2O world, and then he joined us actually, right, as a, as a, one of the first data scientists, an mm -hmm. actual real, really good data scientist. And, and he, he's now a grandmaster, but he also was a master back then. And he made me a master actually when we joined up together. So thanks to him, I became a master because he gave me some good insights and showed me what's possible outside of just fitting an algorithm, right? He was the one that understood the data, and I was the one who just understood the algorithm and I, I fit it well, but the data was bad basically. And he made the data good and then he fitted on it with a good model and together that yeah. was so powerful. So that gave me the insights that something like driverless was necessary. And Can you? He was the guy who made me a master. <laughs> so you also competed uh, both uh, solo and in teams with uh, Mark Landry and others. Uh, can you talk about the experience of teaming up with them on Kaggle versus teaming up with the grandmasters at S2O.ai? Yes, yes. So teaming up with the grandmasters at the workplace obviously is, is a privilege that not many have to that extent. And that's really amazing. Right? To, you, can, you can basically see their creativity and their, their insights. Whatever code they deliver is usually very accurate and very useful. And I would say... I, I don't get enough of the Kaggle secrets from them yet. So <laughs> that's something that's missing, right? They're, they're not sharing all these secrets that quickly. But they still want to win Kaggle, right? <laughs> and if we put it all into driverless right away, then it might be, a, a, you know, be too smart. But I, I'm not quite sure that's really true. I think they're, they're giving us all the generalizable things. And then the specific insights for specific problems sometimes are like left on the table. And mm -hmm. sometimes by talking to them, we can brainstorm and I have ideas, they have ideas and we, we, we swing them around. But then in the end, nothing gets implemented because it doesn't quite fit the framework or it's, it's overly too much, right? It's like, it's a crazy feature somewhere that only is useful in like one thousands of cases. It might not be worth it, but it's still a good uh, Gedanken experiment, how to do something with a given problem. And, I think that's what I enjoy the most is this ping ponging of ideas. And mm -hmm. I would say um, at Kaggle, I don't really do many joint team efforts anymore. I usually do it solo because I want to just see if I can do it. But I did one with uh, John, who's a really good engineer at H2O AI, and who is one of the main committers of driverless AI as well. And we, we pair program almost every day. And John and I teamed up for this, this IEEE fraud problem that just finished. And, 
now driverless with just two extra features in the beginning ends up in 40th place out of the well, box. It's pretty useful. So we basically learned a lot after spending a few days on, on that cargo problem. So I think teaming up is a good idea, um, but I don't have enough time to actually do them service, right? I can't waste a grandmaster's uh, reputation by sitting on their team and not spending <laughs> whole two months on it. So since I only have a few days for a competition, if at all, I would say they're better off on their own. But mm -hmm. I, w I would have liked to know what they're doing, at least. <laughs> they're not sharing because that's against the rules. And that's, <laughs> it's yeah. a bummer, but that's what it is. <laughs> Can you talk more about, uh, broadly speaking, how Kaggle has affected your uh, professional life, if I may, because we constantly even uh, submit to Kaggle via driverless AI, and you do uh, not so often, but still uh, submit to Kaggle, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's a very good uh, benchmark, right? Because the overall quality of the data is quite high, even though there are some leaks from time to time, but the, the, the data sets are ready to be run on. And if you take 10 data sets and just run it against it and you see how you're doing on it, that's a good measurement stick. And I think that's probably the biggest value that we get from, from Kaggle is the, the crowdsourced opinion of what's possible compared to driverless AI, right? And if we can do well against the, 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 the sheer mass of uh, brute force attacks in the world, then that means we're actually good. And if you have a fresh data set from a customer and they say they get 0.8 and driverless gets also 0.8, then that doesn't mean anything, right? It doesn't mean that we're good or that they're good or that we're both bad. It doesn't mean anything because someone else could have gotten 0.9 or 0.7. Yeah. And depending on the metric, you don't even know if that's good or bad. Like it's all open, but if you have Kaggle competition for two months and you get to that <laughs> point, you know that's, that's pretty good, right? So I would say just the, the, the sheer crowdsourcing of ideas to milk every last bit of juice yeah. is something that um, gives us a good or a better benchmark than just one company's internal uh, ideas, let's say. Mm -hmm. Although some companies depend on their models to be accurate. So if, if you're a fraud prevention team at a large bank, you probably have a good model too, right? Yep. But then they won't give us their data. So Kaggle <laughs> is important. They actually do give us their data. So I would say that's, there's already two benefits, right? You have access to data and you have access to the crowdsourced efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, so speaking in terms of company, uh, I believe you're one of the very few Fortune magazine recognized big data stars. Uh, but uh, aside from that, uh, one of the very few great software engineers also happening to be a data scientist, if I may. Uh, what are your thoughts about where should we draw the line for uh, thinking in terms of individual practitioners? Uh, how good of a software engineer should I be when I'm working on data science practices? Because there's some overlap, but uh, data scientists aren't recognized for their best software engineering practices most of the time. Yeah, I would say if you want to be a better data scientist, try to become a better programmer first, a better uh, software engineer, because it, 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 it is silly to rewrite a for loop that does cross-validation over and over, right? For every single competition, copy-paste a thousand things over and over. So um, it, it's better to write a library that kind of works and then just use it. It's a lot more time-saving if you trust it. If you don't trust it, then you should worry about what you did basically why did you do that if it's not trustworthy so i would say the like asking yourself critically is kind of being a software engineer right because if you're a real software engineer you have to test your code and that means you have to question yourself is yeah. it good or not and once you do that then that's a good um foundation for being a data scientist mm -hmm. so you have to be a good software engineer to be a good data scientist i would say um unless you're let's say, able to just juggle a lot of balls and try all these open source frameworks, but even then you have to copy paste code or something. Like you have to have a lot of time if you're a bad software engineer. <laughs> you yeah. have at least saved some time, I would say. So if you want to be an efficient, good software, a uh, good data scientist, then you should be a good software engineer. That's great advice. Do you think uh, driverless AI can help someone become a com competition master or grandmaster? Absolutely, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> 
if you if you follow what driverless does you're already at a good starting point <laughs> <laughs> this has been a great interview my final question uh, to you would be what best advice do you have someone for who's just getting started with kaggle or machine learning data science broadly speaking well if you're on kaggle that's already good if you're not on kaggle then try to get on kaggle that's always my advice but i would say in general probably think more about the setup then about the number that you're getting right think more about uh, think as if you are the algorithm what data is given to you what do you see and then think again and then think again like what actually are you getting going to get what are the features what are the meanings of the features oh you're getting the answer from tomorrow well that's not what you really would get in production right so you have to think about it you should only get stuff that's available at training time and then also at test time you should think about that kind of stuff and what does it mean you do cross validation does it really mean that each split is somehow you know given to you in what sense like is it is it over time or is it random shuffle or is it stratified or is it stratified by city or by you know row id or by age groups or how do you want to split the data and sometimes just splitting the data the right way makes a huge difference to the outcome right imagine if you have pictures of the same people and then you so randomly split the data set that's a kaggle distracted drivers problem for the all state yeah you make huge mistakes if you just do a random split right and i would say just trying to learn about those kinds of issues is the first step i would do if i had to do it all over again not learn really how to algorithms learn how to think as a data scientist before you work as a data scientist yes that's the hard part right how can you become, <laughs> like you need to be careful not to make these mistakes but most likely you should make those mistakes first so do some kaggle problems but i would say the best thing you can do is take 10 old kaggle problems and just try one per day Yeah. for uh, or two weeks or something and then see how you're doing right and then read the winners posts and then like think about it for the next two years why you That's didn't put this way or something <laughs> so yeah <laughs> work from others don't make all the mistakes again and use these tools to to make you a better data scientist That's great advice. Podcast like yours, right? With <laughs> <laughs> all your podcast you probably know a lot more so i would say it's it's good to learn from others Uh, thanks for that great advice before we end the call what would be the best platforms to follow you oh i would say twitter is a okay. good one and uh, linkedin is a little bit more uh, slow let's say i just need to engage to vote us <laughs> okay but it's better sometimes to get my uh, personal opinions as well we'll have both of them linked in case uh, you all want to follow arno thank you so much arno again for joining me on the podcast and all of your contribution Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.